Hi, I'm John Fredrickson and welcome to the ICDB Institute. In this new set of videos, we're going to talk about how to assess and treat anxiety. The first thing you need to know is that anxiety is not a thought. For example, a patient says, I'm afraid I'll grow old and alone. That's not anxiety, actually. That's a thought about the future. Now, that thought may perpetuate anxiety, but it is not anxiety itself. The second thing you need to know is that anxiety is not a stimulus. For instance, you've all heard the term uh, abandonment anxiety. Abandonment is not anxiety, but it can certainly be a stimulus. And if someone threatens to abandon you, you will definitely feel anxious. So what is anxiety anyway? It's a feeling, a physical experience in the body. According to neuroscientists, we've inherited from the mammals a non-conscious danger detection system. It predates the evolution of the human prefrontal cortex and operates independently of it. We get anxious bodily before we know it consciously. How does that happen? The animal part of our brain responds before the human part does. Think about how adaptive that is. Imagine if one of our ancestors saw a saber-toothed tiger and then thought, hmm, that looks like a furry quadruped running towards me. It certainly has large teeth. Crunch. Our ancestor would have become dinner. Instead, our ancestors fought that tiger or they ran away from it. That's because the danger detection system sends a message to the amygdala in the brain. The amygdala mobilizes our bodies so we can respond to that threat. How does it do that? Well, the amygdala sends a message to the somatic nervous system, which mobilizes your muscles, tensing them up so you engage in fight or flight. So when you get really tense, that's a sign of anxiety created by your somatic nervous system. But for our muscles to fight or to flee, they need lots of energy. So the amygdala also sends a message to the sympathetic nervous system, which increases your blood pressure, your pulse, and breathing rate so your muscles get the food they need. That's why your heart pounds, your face flushes, and your hands get cold, right? Because blood gets withdrawn from the extremities and goes to your muscles so you can run or fight, okay? Your mouth gets dry when you give a talk in public. Those are also signs of anxiety created by your sympathetic nervous system. Now, what if that tiger actually caught you and crushed you in its jaws? Then the amygdala activates your parasympathetic nervous system. It releases opiates to decrease the pain and it helps the body to go limp. Why? Well, sometimes if you go limp as if you're dead, a predator will drop you if it's not hungry. The parasympathetic nervous system lowers our pulse, our breath rate, and blood pressure, resulting in a drop of blood flow to the brain. That's why you get blurry vision, ringing in the ears, problems thinking, dizziness, nausea, diarrhea, and migraines. Those are signs of anxiety created by your parasympathetic nervous system. Now, this danger system works just great when it's activated by objective threats like lions, tigers, and bears, or that crazy nutcase on the freeway who just swerved into your lane, okay? We call these symptoms fear when they're triggered by external dangers, and we call them anxiety when they're triggered internally by our feelings. Now, before we get into the causes of anxiety and how to regulate it, Let's take a deeper look into the symptoms. Anxiety symptoms caused by the somatic nervous system, okay? This is where you see thumbs and hands clench. These are patients who have tension headaches. Their arms, shoulders, and neck get tense, right? Or they're wiggling their neck to relieve tension. These are patients when you ask them about a feeling, they sigh, <sighs> right? Intercostal muscle activation. These are patients where they are tense in their arms, feet, and legs. These symptoms are associated with fibromyalgia, hyperventilating, and fainting. 
chronic tensing of the pelvic muscles from the somatic nervous system can result in painful sensations, painful menstruation, painful intercourse, menstrual irregularity, and can be a cause for vulvodynia. Now let's shift to anxiety symptoms that are caused by the sympathetic nervous system. When this system is activated, you get dry mouth. For instance, when you're talking, uh, you get dry eyes. Your pupils get dilated. So if a patient comes into the office and says, oh, could you put the blinds down? It's too bright in here. That lets you know, oh, their sympathetic nervous system is activated and their pupils are dilated. These are patients where their hands are cold and you shake their hand, right? Blood has withdrawn from the hands to their large muscles. These are patients where their heart rate is elevated. They have high blood pressure. Their respiration is fast. They may be slightly flushed, okay? These patients usually suffer from constipation. Uh, these are patients where you'll see them kind of shiver in the room, or you'll see piloerection, right? It's like where their hair stands on end. These are all signs of anxiety from the sympathetic nervous system. We also have anxiety symptoms caused by the parasympathetic nervous system. These are patients where they uh, salivate a lot, and you see them swallowing a lot. They get teary eyes. Their pupils are very constricted. When you shake hands, their hands are very warm. They have a decreased heart rate, low blood pressure, low respiration, and they have gastrointestinal problems. These are patients where they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. When you explore feelings, they have stomach problems. These are patients who suddenly need to uh, go to the bathroom when feelings rise. These are patients who get a migraine in session when feelings rise. They can also suffer from cardiac arrhythmia. They get dizziness because blood pressure drops. They get foggy thinking, bodily anesthesia, limpness, ringing ears, blurry vision. Okay. Now, why is this so important? Why is John going into all this medical talk? Well, first of all, a lot of the time, patients don't realize they're anxious because they don't realize that these are actually symptoms of anxiety, right? They say, oh, I think it was just something I ate, right? But these are symptoms of anxiety. But if you know these are symptoms of anxiety, you can assess and regulate anxiety much better and really do your patients a service. Second, the types of anxiety symptoms patients have tell us whether their anxiety is well-regulated or whether it's too high. If anxiety is too high, the patient's brain can't function well enough to benefit optimally from therapy. Very often we find that patients have failed in previous therapies not due to their resistance, but due to the fact that their anxiety was not well enough regulated. In our next video, we'll show you how to identify when anxiety is too high and how to regulate it. In the meantime, feel free to check out my webinar on anxiety at www istdbinstitute.com slash webinars or see my psychotherapy video on anxiety which you can also purchase there. In the meantime, I'm John Fredrickson and thanks so much for visiting us at the ISTDP Institute.